statistics serial killer Michael Madison. Two weeks shy of Halloween, 1977, Michael Madison was born on October 15th in Cleveland, Ohio. His parents, Diane Madison and Joan Baldwin, accidentally got pregnant and didn't have much of a relationship at the time of his birth. John Baldwin left Diane to care for their young son and denied being Michael's father. Growing up, Diane's mother had been a sex worker and heroin addict. She grew up in a household full of neglect. Diane's upbringing left her unprepared to care for her young son independently. Shortly after giving birth to her son, Michael, social workers were brought into the home. Diane was allowing her constant stream of boyfriends to punish Michael. When Michael was two, Diane was found to have forcefully stuffed food down Michael's throat. As a result, the toddler began vomiting uncontrollably. Unsure of what to do, Diane put her screaming son into a tub full of hot water. This caused Michael to cry more. Growing frustrated with her young son, Diane took him out of a bath and beat him with an extension cord. A year later, one of Diane's many boyfriends beat Michael so severely with a belt that the young boy vomited and needed to be hospitalized. In another horrific incident, Michael was beaten so severely by another one of Diane's boyfriends that he lost hearing in one of his ears. After years of abuse, Michael was sent to live with his grandmother, who was still a heroin addict and sex worker. But unfortunately, Michael's horrific childhood wouldn't change. Michael continued to be hospitalized for reasons such as dehydration. The social workers involved in Michael's case would note that he and his half-brother were covered in scratches and bruises. Before Michael reached high school, he had become a familiar face to law enforcement. On several occasions, the teenager had been found using lemon. In high school, he received a delinquent charge for inappropriately touching another classmate. The crimes Michael committed as a teenager were nothing like the ones he would go on to commit as an adult. In July 2013, the family of 38-year-old Angela Deskins reported her missing after they hadn't heard from her since June. Deskins was known for disappearing from time to time, so the family didn't think much of it. A month after she went missing, her body was discovered wrapped in electrical cords with a belt around her neck. 28-year-old Shadisha Sheely was reported missing in September 2012 when she didn't show up at her mother's house. Sheely, along with her 12-year-old daughter, were living with extended family at the time, and Sheely was supposed to stop by her mother's house to borrow some money, but she never showed. Her body was found in July 2013 inside a plastic garbage bag. After returning home from her job at an elementary school, 18-year-old Sherelda Terry disappeared. Her body was also found inside a black trash bag. On July 19, 2013, Michael's neighbors called the police to report a horrible smell coming from a garage near his second floor apartment building. Inside the garage, the police discovered the decomposing body of a woman. During the police search of the surrounding area, including other vacant homes and backyards, the police found the bodies of two more women. Each was wrapped in plastic bags and located approximately 200 yards apart. The police were granted a search warrant for Michael's home, and inside they found further evidence of decomposition. Now the search was on to find where Michael Madison was. The police tracked him down to his mother's house. When they arrived, Michael refused to come out, resulting in a several-hour alone standoff between him and the police before he finally agreed to come out and was taken into police custody. Michael never once showed remorse to the victim's families during the trial. Michael laughed, smiled, and taunted the families. During Shirella Terry's father's victim impact statement, Michael smiled at the distraught father. This set Terry's father off, and he tried to attack Michael but was quickly stopped. Michael didn't stop smiling once during the altercation. The jury deliberated less than a day before Michael Madison was found guilty of all three murders. He was also found guilty of three counts of kidnapping, three counts of gross abuse of a corpse, one count of rape and one count of weapons possession by an ex-convict. On May 20, 2016, Michael was sentenced to death, a sentence he would attempt to appeal a month later. On July 21, 2020, the Ohio Supreme Court voted unanimously to uphold the death sentence for Michael Madison, killer Ronald O'Brien. 
children are cautioned from an early age not to accept candy from strangers. While this golden rule is strictly enforced by vigilant parents throughout the year, on Halloween night, they throw caution to the wind and allow their little ones to go door to door asking for treats. In most instances, their request is granted without worry. Even so, once in a while, the monsters that lurk in the shadows take advantage of the occasion, resulting in dire consequences for the most innocent among us. In 1974, a boy in Pasadena, Texas fell victim to just such a predator when he became violently ill after indulging in a treat from his Halloween bag. Ever the concerned parent, his father had stayed by his side during the hour-long ordeal, offering comfort to the youngster as he convulsed on the bathroom floor. Only eight years old at the time, Timothy O'Brien died later that night on his way to the hospital. In a shocking turn of events, an autopsy revealed that he had ingested enough potassium cyanide to kill two grown men. As difficult as it was to believe, all signs pointed to the fact that someone had deliberately laced candy with a colorless compound before randomly handing it out to unsuspecting children. Investigators were convinced that a cold-blooded killer was hiding somewhere in the suburbs of Houston and they intended to find him. With no suspects in mind and little evidence to go on, detectives theorized that an unscrupulous person who was angry at the world in general had decided to take the life of a complete stranger, a child no less, as a way of getting back at society. To make a difficult situation even worse, there was no telling how many children have received the tainted sweets. Although authorities had put out an emergency news bulletin requesting that all Halloween candy be brought to the police station for inspection, they feared that there would be other victims before all was said and done. While they faced an uphill battle, to be sure, investigators did have a few things working in their favor. For one, it had been raining heavily on the evening of trick or treat, which had limited the number of houses that Timothy and his sister Elizabeth had visited. More importantly, a chemical analysis of the contents of the boys' treat bank had enabled them to pinpoint the carrier of the poison. Lab tests revealed that the killer's a weapon of choice had been the sweet and sour powder contained inside of a straw-shaped pixie sticks. After meeting with the residents of the houses where the O'Brien children were known to have gotten candy, detectives were confident that none of them had given up pixie sticks. However, during the course of their interviews, they learned that someone had been witness doling out that particular treat and that someone had been Timothy's father, Monald O'Brien. When he was brought in for questioning, O'Brien claimed that a man he had never seen before had emerged from a darkened home and given him several pixie sticks to hand out on his behalf. He added that, after consuming a small amount of the sugary powder, Timothy had complained that it tasted funny. Instead of telling him to throw it out, he had given his son a soft drink to help wash it down. Under the pretense of helping police solve the case, he had readily provided them with the address of the house where the exchange had taken place. Upon speaking with the mystery man, who turned out to be an air traffic controller named Clarty Melvin, officers learned that he had an alibi for the night in question. According to him, he had been at work and had not returned home until well after midnight. When they visited his place of employment, his supervisor confirmed his story and had the paperwork to prove it. In a stunning show of support, 200 of Melvin's co-workers came forward to vouch for his character. Realizing that they had been duped, investigators quickly concluded that this man was not their killer, something that Ronald O'Brien had known all along. A bit of digging into his past uncovered that Ronald O'Brien, who had trained as an optician, was not nearly as respectable as he wanted others to believe. I'm not content who couldn't hold a job, he was drowning in a sea of debt. Not above taking what he wanted, he had been accused of stealing on numerous occasions, usually by former employers. While being shiftless and prone to theft doesn't necessarily mean that someone is capable of murder, the fact that O'Brien had taken out hefty life insurance policies not one but three, on his children in the months prior to his son's untimely death moved him to the top of the list of suspects. Another nail in O'Brien's self-constructed coffin tamed when it was discovered that he had phoned the insurance company on the morning after his son's death inquiring about a payout. As the eight-year-old's body lay in the icy morgue, his father's only concern had been how quickly the money he had coming would change hands. On November 5th, 1974, less than a week after Timothy was poisoned, Monald O'Brien was taken into custody and formally charged with one count of murder and four counts of attempted murder. To no one's surprise, he pleaded not guilty across the board. 
he would steadfastly maintain his innocence throughout the trial, despite the damning evidence against him. During the proceedings, a parade of witnesses testified that O'Brien had become fixated on the properties of cyanide in the months leading up to his son's murder. His obsession led him to praise him as friends and family alike if they knew where he could purchase the deadly poison. He would also inquire of them if they had any idea how much of the substance it would take to kill a person. In June of 1975, eight months after little Timothy O'Brien had been laid to rest, his father was convicted of his murder. He was also found guilty in the attempted poisonings of the other four children, none of whom had ingested the lethal powder. For his crimes, Ronald O'Brien, whom the press had dubbed the Candyman, was condemned to the electric chair. Down the road, as alternative methods of execution were introduced, his punishment was amended to a more humane death by lethal injection. It had taken the jury just over an hour to decide the fate of the man who had so callously plotted and carry up the murder of someone who had trusted him implicitly. Once the verdict was in, the waiting game began. As it happened, nine years would pass more time than Timothy had spent on this earth before his tiller would face flammal justice. During his time on death row, O'Brien was reviled by his fellow inmates who, despite their own misdeeds, considered him to be lower than a snake's belly. Their hatred of the child killer ran so deep that they had thrown a party on the day of his demise to let him know that he would not be missed. After several days of execution, O'Brien was put to death on March 31, 1984, at the age of 39. When asked if he had any last words, he had taken the opportunity to rail against the system that had allowed him to come to such an end. When his death was announced over the loudspeaker, hundreds of people who had gathered outside the prison to celebrate the attention had shouted trick or treat while throwing handfuls of candy in the air in remembrance of Timothy, a young boy who had paid the ultimate price for his father's greed. Todd Allen Reed, the Forest Park Tiller. The bodies of three women were found in the same stretch of parkland, all within a month of each other. It was not long before police had their ma'am. But is he responsible for more than the three murders they convicted him for? 32-year-old Todd Allen Reed was already a registered sex offender when he strangled to death at least three women before dunking their naked bodies in Forest Park, a heavily wooded area just west of Portland, Oregon. From 1992 to 1995, he had served a measly two and a half years of a 12-year sentence for the sexual assault of Shelley Harding, who was seven months pregnant at the time of his cowardly attack. She had been walking home from work when he approached her and forced her into his car at knife point. Reed was involved to him and fled the scene of a minor crash with another vehicle on his way to the secluded spot where he sexually assaulted Shelley. After he had assaulted her, he attempted to strangle her with a seatbelt and began to cry. Shelley was strong and she was calm. She had been talking to Reed constantly, like he was a friend almost, building a rapport. Whilst doing so, she made sure to leave as much physical evidence as she could, touching every surface to leave as many of her prints as possible. Whatever this monster was going to do to her, she wasn't going to make it easy for him to get away with. When Reed broke down, she used this to her advantage and her pleas to be let go and her promises that she would not tell anyone worked. Reed let her go. Not only did Shelley report her abduction and assault, the two men that had been in the car that Reed had crashed into also reported the hit and mun they even had his license plate. Reed pleaded no contest and was handed the 12-year sentence. He was registered as a sex offender and, crucially, his DNA was taken and stored in the state crime lab. This would be the golden ticket police needed to catch the Forest Park serial killer seven years later. Reed was released early as he had built up sentence reducing credits, half of which were for good behavior. At roughly eight miles long and 5,100 acres, Forest Park is one of the largest urban forest reserves in the USA, ranked 19th to be more precise. It is not easy to wander from the 70 miles of trails due to the park's dense vegetation. To highlight just how secluded this park can get, once you're off trail, in 2004, a 53-year-old man called Frank and his 12-year-old daughter Ruth were discovered to be living off-grid in the park. They had been there for four years, completely undetected. On May 7, 1999, a couple walking their dog on one of the park's more and more trails would come across the body of 28-year-old Wella Faye Mahler. She was naked and face down, 
entangled in thick blackberry brambles. She had been strangled, and it was determined that her body had been there for around two months. Police would find a used condom merely 28 feet from her body. They were able to extract DNA from this vital piece of evidence. The next day, May 8th, police themselves would discover a second body whilst they were searching the immediate area. The body of 26-year-old Stephanie Lynn Mussel was found around a quarter of a mile away from where Lilla had been discovered. She too was found naked and had been strangled. Tests would determine she had been left there less than a week before she was found. They would also recover traces of DNA on her thighs. A group of hikers would find the third body, that of 18-year-old Alexandria Eisen, in the early evening of June 2nd. Alexandria had been reported missing sometime in May. Police were unable to reach her body until the next day, due to the location, she'd been dumped down an extremely steep slope, just off of a deer path. She was found naked and she too had been strangled. Her body was around one quarter of a mile away from Loa and Stephanie's. After the discovery of Alexandria's body, police chief Charles Moves admitted that investigators had concluded they were looking for a serial killer due to the similarities of the crimes. Physically, all three women resembled each other, but they also had very similar life experiences. They were all homeless at the time of their deaths and had cocaine and heroin addictions, although Stephanie had just completed a detox program before her murder. Lilla and Alexandria or had been at some point engaged in prostitution to pay for these addictions. All three women were known to frequent West Burnside Street. It's also been claimed that Lilla and Stephanie knew each other, although this has not been proven either way. It was determined that all three of the women had been murdered elsewhere and their bodies were taken to Forest Park afterwards. Toxicology all showed that they had taken heroin sometime before their deaths. The police response was immediate and it was impressive. A specialist task force consisting of 16 individuals was formed and they set about scouting bars, reaching out and offering protection to the community being targeted and 30 additional beds were made available for homeless women during the investigation. Although residents were not happy about the lack of information they were receiving, the police kept their investigation tightly under wraps, such was their determination to catch this killer. The task force would use the physical similarities of the three women to their advantage. A female officer of a similar appearance posed as a prostitute on West Burnside Street to see if they could reel the killer in. And sure enough, Reed took the bait. On the July 7th, the same day a vigil was being held for Lilla, Stephanie, and Alexandria, Reed approached the undercover officer and it was not long before his suspicious behavior flagged him to police. At about 5.20 a.m., he was approached by a member of the lookout team, Sergeant John Botchlet. Reed readily admitted that he was a sex offender and agreed to a search of his vehicle. They found an unused condom, a book entitled The Killing Gift, about a woman who can kill men by nearly looking at them, and some yellow strapping. There was nothing incriminating to be found, and the police had to let him go. He was not off the hook, however, far from it. Another lookout that night, Detective Sergeant Dave Schlegel, recognized him from the 1992 sexual assault case he had in fact than the arresting officer. Police began 24-hour surveillance of Reed, both at his home and at his place of work. At least once during this surveillance, he was observed driving in circles around West Burnside and Sandy Boulevard. The police lab results came back and confirmed that the DNA from the condom that the Moore crime scene and the DNA found on Stephanie's thighs matched the DNA that was on file for Todd Allen Reed. At around 7.30 p.m. on July 18th, after Reed had left for work, police executed a search warrant at his address, where he lived with his girlfriend. Once the police had left the premises, his girlfriend phoned him to let him know the police had been there. He attempted to make a getaway in the middle of his shift, but it was too late. The police had already arrived. At 11.30 p.m. on July 18th, 11 days after police had questioned him and only one and a half months after the task force was set up, Reed was arrested outside of Renella Produce, the warehouse where he worked night shifts, unloading the delivery trucks. On July 27th, he was indicted on seven criminal counts in relation to three homicides. It emerged that Reed, who had been ordered to serve eight years post-prison supervision and actually been ticked out of a sex offender treatment program two weeks before his arrest for failure to attend. 
On February 23, 2001, he pleaded guilty and received three consecutive life sentences with no possibility of parole. Re had been facing the death penalty, but his plea deal took this off of the table. Reed is also the prime suspect in two, possibly three, other murders in the Portland area. The cases being referred to by Reese are the 1987 cold case murders of 15-year-old Jennifer Lyncher and 12-year-old Mindy Colleen Thomas and the 1999 disappearance of 19-year-old Alma the Signs. In regards to the murders, Gresham Police Sergeant David Lerwick has been quoted as saying, Always suspect that he was the person who killed both those girls. We didn't have enough evidence to convict him. Jennifer had gone missing on July 3rd, 1987 and her skeletal remains was found on July 8, 1988. Mingy went missing from the apartment complex where she lived on August 3, 1987 and her body was discovered on October 4, 1988. Both of the children had been strangled and dumped in wooded areas on the eastern side of Gresham, about three miles apart and they were both last seen in the company of Gail Bennett, Reed's then girlfriend and later wife. They married in 1988 and divorced in 1997. Cresham police said Bennett, who has a police record of her own, might have information about the killings but has been uncooperative. Bennett has denied any knowledge. At the time, police were operating under the assumption that they had both been killed by the same man and that this man was known to them. They had questioned Reed at the time of the investigation due to the fact they had both been seen with Gale, but he was never charged or arrested. Police renewed efforts to solve the Gresham cases after his arrest in the Portland killings, but attempts to compare DNA from the old crimes with Reed's DNA have been inconclusive. Alma the witness seen on June 30th, 1999 and has not been seen since. She was working as a prostitute at the time of her disappearance and it has been claimed she knew Slash was friends with Alexandria Eisen. No charges have been brought forward in her case, although it is impossible to downplay the likelihood that they already had something to do with Amethyst's disappearance. As of June 2020, what prison Reed is in is not known, and as of June 2021, he was no longer listed as an inmate and may be dead.